Hey everybody, I have a little something special for you today and I wanted to give you the backstory for how this all came about. So this summer, I traveled with my family throughout Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, South Dakota, and along this trip, we visited many of the historic places in America that I had only just read about. Historic places as well as beautiful places in nature all of these places really reminded me about how amazing America is. And it was a great opportunity to experience it with my young children. But also as a journalist, it was a reminder for why on the ground reporting really matters. When you arrive at a place with a little bit of a point of reference, but really let curiosity be your guide, that's where the magic of storytelling really happens because that curiosity leads to information that just delights you and informs you and makes you feel a little bit smarter about your world. So As you've seen over the last several weeks, I've shared little tidbits with you of things that I've learned along the way. I wasn't quite sure what we'd encounter, but if I found something interesting, I've been able to create videos or podcasts about that. And I look forward to doing a lot more of this because I love this sort of work. And history provides the context for so many of the stories we're experiencing today. So many of the themes of stories that we're experiencing today resonate with the past as well. So the past is really important to inform us about the present. It's one of the the things I think is actually missing from general news coverage. So many places in America, though, that are historically important, you could just sort of drive by. That's one of the things I've learned. Like if you didn't know they were there, you could just sort of drive by it. This is a case for the National Monument, uh, the battlefield for the Battle of Little Bighorn, also known as Custer's Last Stand. I mean, it's clearly marked. But if you didn't know it was there, you could just kind of zoom right by. Well, I'm lucky that we were able to stop and spend some time there. And I had I had some reference of what this was about, what this battle was about. But generally speaking, you had the US military on one side, you had the Native Americans on the other, and it was a resounding defeat of the US military by the Native American tribes that has become not only an important historical story, but the story of legends. It's been the subject of a series of books and documentaries and movies. It's taken historians and journalists decades to research the different parts of this because as I realized, and I didn't know it, just how complicated and interesting and important this story really is. So as we arrive at the visitor center, there's a park ranger that says that he's going to start a talk outside. So my kids are sort of playing outside. It's a beautiful day. You see the wind whipping across this, this beautiful prairie and you see the tombstones in the background. And as this park ranger starts to speak, you know right away, he is a very special storyteller. Hundreds and hundreds of warrior heads crawling up to the top of the hill in the grass, raising up and shooting and getting down. It must have puzzled the souls on the hilltop to know which head to shoot at. There were so many of them. What would it have sounded like on that day? They said it sounded like someone was taking a blanket, ripping it in half. That's what the gunfire was like. He would have heard the shrill sound of eagle bone whistles blown by the warriors to get the everywhere spirit to protect you. And so afterwards, I approached him and said, would you just, can I just interview you? I, I just would love to share some of this story. One of the things that the National Park Service writes on their website about this, this particular place is that The story of Little Bighorn is a sum of all the people involved. And I love that imagery for storytelling, but also journalism, because so often in today's world, it feels like you have to choose a side or a perspective. When really we want to weave these perspectives together, it's the sum of all parts that create the story. And that's what I thought was really captured in the conversation that you're about to hear. I'm just going to let it play beginning to end so you can hear the entire conversation. And yes, while it's not a documentary, we can call it a smarter summary because in just a 10 minute period, I think you'll gain a lot of perspective, as I know I did, about why this event mattered, why it's historically important, and how it changed the course of America. I hope you enjoy it.
So just start off, tell me your name. Yeah, my name is Michael Donahue, and I'm a seasonal ranger here at Little Bighorn. And I've been uh, studying the battle for about 51 years, and I have worked here at the battlefield for 33 summers. So I'm the longest serving seasonal ranger. And what do you do in the off season? In the off season, I'm a college art professor at Temple College in Temple, Texas. Uh, I was an art major and a history minor. And so I've always loved the history of the West and have been writing and researching and, uh, and talking about this battle for, for a long time. Well, it takes a lot to be reading and researching to then coming here and working in your part-time for three decades. It does, it does. I love this place. Uh, part of it's the symbolism I love. Um, the fact that this was a major change of life. This is basically what we would say in the Civil War, Gettysburg was a high water mark. Little Bighorn's the high water mark of the Indian Wars and kind of concludes almost 400 years of fighting between the natives and, and the non-natives. And uh, like I said, I call it Custer's last stand, but in essence, it also became the last stand of the Lakota and the Cheyenne people because they will never win another victory like this after, after Little Bighorn. It's also interesting too, because of the personalities of the people here. Uh, you've got George Custer, a famous Civil War general who everybody knows. He was kind of a rock star of his period. Uh, you've got Crazy Horse, uh, an amazingly great warrior for the Oglala Nation. And then you've got Sitting Bull, a medicine man, a spiritual leader, who's the charismatic guy who brings all these people together to fight for this traditional way of life. And he has a major influence on gathering all these people in one big camp. Uh, a lot of people on the reservation are distraught over the conditions and the time is ripe for Sitting Bull to get them to leave and he's able to do that. And this village doubles in size to about 8,000 people four days before Custer gets here. So I guess you could say Custer's timing was a little bit bad here. Uh, it took him six weeks to get out here on horseback. So uh, there's a lot of things happening. Uh, warriors leaving the reservation as Custer's out here looking for this village. It's supposed to be a punitive attack. It's uh, uh, ordained by the President U.S. Grant. It's important to remember that Custer's just an officer following his, uh, his, uh, his orders. And that's what a lot of people think he's making Indian policy, but that's not his job out here, it's to follow orders. What was the context for the battle? What was happening before it? Well, there's a tremendous recession going on in, in America in 1873, called the Panic of 1873. High unemployment, up to 19%. A lot of immigrants getting off the boats, Americans don't want them here, they're taking our jobs. And a lot of them are Irish and Germans. And so most of these soldiers are young guys who can't get a job. You know, the Irish are going into Boston and New York and they're seeing signs in the wind that Irish need not apply, we don't want you here. So many of them in order not to, to, to starve to death in America will hold up their hand, they'll become uh, uh, members of the 7th Cav or, or other units out here, of course. And uh, the largest amount of the guys here, soldier-wise, are Irish almost 14% and 13% are Germans. So you would have heard a lot of foreign accents out here on the battlefield. So about half of them weren't even born in the United States. Yeah, 40% of the seven Cav were born in a foreign country. And about 25 to 30% were, were green recruits for the most part. So that's, uh, that's another fact of when the seven Cav. When you say green recruits, what do you well, mean? Well, they had not been in combat before. You know, they were just basically enlisted right before the battle, not too long before. So uh, the officer corps out here was experienced. Most of them were Civil War veterans. And so they, they were pretty good shots. And um, um, the unfortunate thing for the soldiers is they didn't get much practice with their weapons. Because of the recession, they weren't allowed to have much ammunition to practice with. And that's going to change after this battle in the Battle of the Rosebud. The Army will become an army of marksmen. But getting back to your question, there's black... Hills Gold discovered in 1874. Uh, Grant thinks that'll open up a stimulus package for him, and he tries to buy the Black Hills from the Lakota who own those hills unsuccessfully. And so Grant, an angry Grant, just gives the Lakota an ultimatum, and sitting on an ultimatum. You've got to return to your reservation in South Dakota before the 31st of, of January in 1876. Otherwise, I'll consider you hostile. I'll send the Army out to get you. And so that's what happens. So Sitting Bull remains out here with his people, encouraging people to leave the reservation. And, uh, and so the campaign of 1876 begins with three, three different columns coming out looking for Sitting Bull, and only Custer will find them. Can you talk to me about what we're seeing over your shoulder here? Well, behind me, I think you're gonna see uh, Last Stand Hill where George Custer and about 40 men were found. 
uh, at the top of the hill at the end of the battle, which only lasted about 20 minutes for Custer and those 40 men. Uh, some of the men shot their horses on the very top of the hill and uh, they would be found after the battle. Custer on the very top up there with his brother Tom, who by the way won two medals of honor uh, in the Civil War. And one of the few men to win two Congressional Medals of Honor. But they're found on the top of the hill and they're gonna be buried uh, on, the, on the, the hill side up there. And we know that Custer's bodies were moved a year after the battle and taken to West Point. The rest of the men are left on the battlefield uh, until 1881 when they're all dug up and put around that big stone on top of the hill, which is a mass grave. And later on, the Army's going to put these white markers to show where they died and where they were originally buried. As far as we know, there's no soldiers out there today. Uh, there's also red granite markers for the warriors today as we work with the tribes and their families. Uh, those have been erected in the last 20 years. And you said it's the only battlefield that has these sort yeah, of Yeah, it's the only battlefield in the entire world. It's very distinctive. It's the only battlefield in the entire world that has distinctive markers for combatants on both sides. Uh, there's just nothing like it in the world. And so a lot of people come here and they see the markers and they can, in their mind's eye, kind of visualize what was happening, where soldiers died, where warriors died during the battle. What is something that you feel most people don't know about Custer's last stand in the Battle of Little Bighorn? They don't know how fast it occurred. It was over within 20 minutes. And I think one of the things they don't realize is there's groups of these markers all over the battlefield. And so Custer had a last stand, but so did the guys down in the deep ravine. They fought to the end. On Calhoun Hill, there was another last stand. And behind the ridge, there was another last stand. So all of these guys, uh, they're chased by the warriors and surrounded. They all have their own last stands. And they all put up a pretty ferocious fight for the most part. How does it feel to work here? You know, it's, a, it's kind of a sad place. It's a very sad story. You know, uh, you might want to say the Lakotas were winners here, but in the long run, they weren't winners here. And of course, anytime you have loss of life in a combat situation, you're always thinking about, you know, the death, the family members who are behind, whether it's down in the camp or whether it's on top of the hill. You know, it was, it was a sad day for people. It was a day of anger. It was a day of, of so many different emotions. Gall talks about that the Arikara scouts that were working with the army, they killed two of his wives and three of his daughters and he fought only with a hatchet, he was angry. And so he loses five family members. But then again, on the other side, you think about Maggie Calhoun, who's Custer's sister. She loses her husband on the ridge a half a mile away, three brothers and a nephew here. Uh, they wiped out pretty much the Custer family except for one brother. So again, tremendous sadness here. Charles Kerouac came here one time. He, probably most people know him from the news. Uh, and he said he thinks this is one of the saddest places in America. And I have a tendency to feel that way as well. When you're here by yourself and there's not a lot of tourists like you walking around, yeah. what goes through your mind? Well, a lot of times I'll go up on top of the hill in the evenings when the gates are closed and, and it's kind of like my battlefield for a few hours. And I like to visualize. I'm a painter and I've actually painted that hillside and uh, kind of painted it from what the warriors would have seen at the end with all that dust and chaos and the soldiers fighting for their lives on top of the hill. And uh, yeah, it's very special. It's, uh, you know, we talk about it, a place where ghosts walk in broad daylight. And I think if you have a little imagination, you can almost sense that. There's something special about this place. You said in your talk today that there's a lesson here too for America. What is yeah. that lesson? Well, I think, I think one of the things, so often we take a historic event, we say it's just past, it's much about a bunch of dead people. But I think the importance of something like this is to tie it together and think about why it happened in the first place. We know that a lot of these actions were based on greed and anger and hatred and racism and prejudice uh, by both sides, by the way. Uh, the, the, the Euro-Americans coming out here looked at, this, at, this, uh, at, the, at the native peoples as being less than human, savages, barbarians, uh, and they believed it was their God-given right, their manifest destiny to take the land. On the other side, you had the Lakota who also felt they were superior people. Uh, they call the white man the Washishu, which means stealer of the fat. In other words, you're a thief. You're taking the best of everything, just based on one's skin color. Uh, and there was some truth to that, obviously, but again, both of these societies kind of felt and looked down on each other. I think that's kind of an interesting thing to, to balance out in the talk here. This was the last stand for George Custer on the, on the top of the hill there for his men. But I also let people know that in reality, it was also the last stand of the Lakota and Cheyenne people. 
even though they want a great victory here, they would also, it'd be the nail in their coffin because the people back east will send out Custer's Avengers and they would never win a victory like this uh, in their existence, never again. And so, uh, you know, we can symbolically say it was a last stand for a way of life for the Lakota and the Cheyenne. And of course, it was a last stand for the soldiers who, who died in the battle here.